So the final coastal case study we want to look at is an example of a coastal habitat. Now, be careful, they're very unlikely to ever use the term sand dunes as there is a choice uh, in this part of the unit. And at Darrington, we choose to do Stubland Bay sand dunes. In the exam, they're probably going to use the term coastal habitat. Um, so what we're going to look at first is how uh, vegetation changes, or something called the vegetation succession, uh, changes as you move inland through the dune system. So first off, we need to think about the conditions that are going to change as you move through the dunes. So if we're starting down here, close to the sea, and then moving inland over to here. So, first thing we need to consider is what's gonna to happen to the salt content as we move that way. And obviously, as we move inland away from the sea, salt is going to decrease. Similarly, as we move this di in this direction, inland, so is the wind that the species of plants are going to have to experience and endure. But, as we do move this way, we will see an increase in soil quality and an increase in the amount of organic matter in the soil. Now those changes are really important because they're going to affect what kind of species we have in each area. So if we start off in this first area here, looking at the embryo and the four dunes, these are the small dunes really close to the sea. Here we're going to have what we call pioneer species. These are going to be plants uh, that are adapted to growing in very high salt conditions in the soil, don't mind enduring very strong winds, and also you know, don't need very good soil to survive in. The kind of plants that survive in these embryo and four dunes are things such as sea rocket, and probably the most common one, okay, is marron grass. Now, the sea rocket survives so well in the embryo dunes because it has no problem with being submerged in salt water uh, for short periods of time. So it doesn't mind if maybe during a storm or very high tide it is submerged. The marron grass really doesn't mind high wind conditions. It's designed so that it has long roots that first off reach down into the water table to get it fresh water, but also bind the sand together. And as a result of that binding the sand together, it stops it being blown away okay, and starts to stabilize the dunes. So the marangos is a really important species for the development of a dune ecosystem. We then move into the next section, okay? the yellow dunes. Okay, this, by now, our salt content is starting to decrease. We are moving away from the, uh, from the sea. Okay, so the salt content and the wind content has gone down. And what we start to see is that we still have species such as marron grass, okay, but the pioneer species such as the sea rocket and the marron grass to a lesser extent uh, are starting to be outcompeted and they start to die off. And they start to get replaced with uh, some sort of other species of plants, such as heather, particularly things like bell heather and ling heather. Mm. These species prefer to not be in such salty or windy conditions, and they also benefit from the fact that some of the dead marron grass and sea rocket decomposes to increase the amount of organic matter in the soil. We then move into the dune slack. Now what's important about the dune slack is it's a low part of the dune system, it's a depression, and it is generally below the water table, okay, which is really important. As a result of being below the water table, okay, the conditions in the dune slack are very damp, very moist, okay, and it's also very sheltered because it's down low, so we don't get a huge amount of wind. Uh, the species of plant that really likes to grow here is something called the creeping willow. Okay, the creeping willow uh, is great for this condition, it loves damp moist conditions and the top of that because it grows horizontally along the ground rather than upwards it stays out of the wind in the sheltered conditions in the dune slack. Finally we move into our mature dunes right at the back. This is now the furthest away that you can get from the, uh, the sea in our dune system and we have something called the vegetation climax. 
This is where vegetation will be at its most developed uh, that the sand dune ecosystem can sustain. So by here, we now have uh, quite a lot of heather, sometimes why we get called the heath dunes. So we've got a large amount of heather. But we also start to see, because salt content is down, wind is down, and organic matter is really much higher, we start to see small trees starting to thrive in this area. Things such as ash, okay, or uh, willow trees are able to grow here. So once we've looked at how vegetation uh, changes across a coastal habitat such as stubborn bay dunes, we now need to look at how that coastal habitat is managed. Now, firstly, when we look at Studland Bay, we need to remember two things. Firstly, it's a site of specific scientific interest, or an SSSI. That means it is protected by law for scientific purposes and conservation. On top of that, it's owned by the National Trust. So again, they can put in bylaws to protect the area. These are normally enforced by uh, park rangers. Now, the other key thing to remember is that actually Studland Bay management is very easy. Firstly, our first strategy is honeypotting. So at Studland Bay, most of the facilities are located around Knoll Car Park. Uh, for example, obviously the car park, but also the cafe, public toilets and water sport activities. That means that most visitors to uh, the sand dunes sort of locate themselves around that area. So the damage that they do is kind of limited to the area directly around that honeypot. Evidence that this works can be found by something called blowouts. These are large circular depressions in the sand dunes of bare sand, normally caused by footpath erosion. And the size of the blowout is dependent on actually how much erosion and disturbance has happened. And we can actually see from Google, Google Earth images that the blowouts get smaller as you move away from the honeypot, suggesting that the honeypot is actually working. Now, the E stands for exclusion. So this is where uh, certain parts of Studland Bay are actually fenced off or sort of uh, banned from, being, uh, from people being able to enter them. Okay, this means uh, that these particularly vulnerable areas aren't subject to people walking over the vegetation and disturbing the wildlife, so they're excluded from that area. We then have zoning. So this is when parts of the uh, Studland Bay dunes are zoned into different activities. So for example, uh, all the water sport activities can only occur directly opposite uh, Knoll Car Park, uh, whereas the uh, nudist beach is at the very far end. Uh, two good things about this is it means that uh, it protects vulnerable areas from disturbance, but also means that lots of people can use uh, the beach without conflict, if, even if their uses or what they want to use the beach for are different. Uh, it does cause a slight issue that maybe some people don't like the fact that they are limited to certain areas, but in general it's quite successful. One of the really good ways of zoning and exclusion is the creation of boardwalks. Not only do the boardwalks protect the uh, vulnerable vegetation underneath them, but it also zones people into certain areas that they will normally follow the boardwalks, so staying away from vulnerable areas. And then finally, we see education. So, uh, for example, all around Studland Bay, you've got signposts educating you about the wildlife that you're walking past and how important it is and how vulnerable it is. And at the same time, they also have talks and conferences run by local experts and park rangers on the importance of protecting the area.